So I want to thank everyone for joining us today. Welcome to our tech industry talks. And for those of you who may not know, our industry talk series is a replacement of our career fairs because we find that a lot of students and panelists have a much better time when they have a closer one-on-one -on -one talk. So through this industry talks, you'll be able to get to know each panelist better. And of course, this event is hosted by the Macaulay Career and Development Office today by myself, but we also have other interns that have helped to put this event together. And so today's agenda for the tech industry talks for about the first hour or so, we're going to focus on certain questions and each panelist will be answering them. And then after that, we'll be doing breakout rooms. So there's going to be a total of six breakout rooms. And for those of you who may not know what a breakout room is, you will be put into a specific room, so one through six. And as Jamie mentioned earlier, if some of you are here, it's kind of like a speed dating, but without the awkwardness. So we're going to be rotating the panelists around. All the students won't have to move. You just stay in your room. And Gia will be the one who is moving everyone around. So it's going to be a total of 10 minutes each in the breakout rooms. And basically that'll be a time for you to ask specific questions you may have for each of the panelists. So as you hear our panelists speak while they answer some of the questions I'm going to be asking, you can jot down any questions you have or just anything you wanna know in general and save it for the breakout rooms. So it's going to be roughly 10 to 12 minutes per session during the breakout rooms, but Gia will be sending messages. So just look for them on the top of your screen. And here are an example of some kind of questions you may have for the panelists. So you might want to ask about their career trajectories, what they do on a day-to-day -day basis, or even what the industry is like. And because the, our panelists today are all from the tech industry, you might have questions about how the COVID and the pandemic has affected their industry because I'm sure almost all of their careers and day-to-day -day jobs have been affected due to COVID-19. So before, oh, I guess that's really it for now, but let me get started and introduce the panelists. And so for each panelist, if you could please just say where you work and where you went to school and just give a little bit of a background about yourself. So I'll start with Julio. Hi everyone. Uh, my name is Julio Bueno. I'm a recruiting program manager for Bloomberg. Um, in this role, I am also the lead recruiter for CUNY. So very excited to be here on behalf of Bloomberg. Um, Bloomberg has a huge commitment to the CUNY system in New York City. Um, and we're really excited to re-engage just CUNY students from our engineering perspective. Um, we have uh, internships and full-time roles available. Uh, for students um, with up to three years experience from the full-time side. Um, we hire students who are from boot camp, who are self-taught uh, on the full-time side, given that we have an eight-week training program um, on the internship. We look for students who have a CS major and um, have taken data structures and algorithms. Uh, some interesting fact about myself is I went to the University of Florida and I have a degree in accounting. Thank you, Julio. And next we have Brian. Hi, everyone. My name is Brian Wang. Um, I currently work for Cerner Corporation. So Cerner is a, one of the major vendors of electronic medical records out there. Um, if you're not sure what an electronic medical record is, um, if you ever go to a doctor's office or hospital and you've seen your nurse or doctor typing away at their computer, they're probably typing away into software that my company or one of the other companies in our field has developed. So I've been working with them for the last four years. Um, I work mainly on the medical device integration side, so connecting medical devices to the electronic health records. Um, prior to that, I actually graduated from Macaulay um, Honors College at City College in 2016 with a degree in biomedical engineering. Okay, thank you, Brian. And next we have Nicola. Hi, uh, my name is Nicola Clements. I am a career coach at CUNY Tech Prep. Um, so I'm not here to talk about my uh, industry experience. because It's not my uh, 
uh, role, but I am excited to talk to anybody who's interested in the CUNY Tech Prep program. We also, uh, you'll talk to Zach in a minute, who's one of our instructors in data science. Um, I went to Boston University and uh, I think that was all the questions, right? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. Okay, uh, next we have Zach. Hi everyone, my name is Zach Desario. I'm currently an instructor at the CUNY TEP program and uh, an instructor for data science. Uh, before that, I was the manager of uh, analytics for Tom Steyer's presidential campaign. And before that, I was a machine learning engineer at Google, so a data scientist at Google. Um, and then before that, I was a professional online poker player. But um, uh, yeah, I'm excited to be here and talk about, I don't know, just give some insight about what it's like working in the tech industry. Okay, thank you, thank Zach. You. And next we have Morel. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Morel Gaskins. I'm the Associate Director of Recruiting. I'm in New York for Co-op Careers. Uh, we're a nonprofit um, organization that helps um, overcome unemployment um, in unrepresented and first-generation uh, graduates in California and New York. Um, so we are, I'm really excited to be here and a little bit about myself. Um, I graduated from St. Michael's College, so if anyone ever um, is in Burlington, Vermont, um, you know, feel free to stop by the campus. It's a nice place to make sure plain, uh, especially nice to get out of the city. Um, and I'm excited to be here. I have uh, industry experience in digital marketing. Um, I've worked as a community manager, a social media brand specialist, um, and now um, I work for Co-op, um, which I am an alumni of the program uh, for full-time, and I do recruiting for, with CUNY. Uh, so I'm excited to be here. Thank you. And last but not least, we have Jonathan. Hey, I'm John Stieglitz. I graduated from Macaulay Hunter in 2010 and uh, with a degree in biology. I went from biology into tech after learning how to code for scientific reasons. And I've worked at three different companies over the last six years, a big old established tech company, a brand new startup, and now I'm somewhere in between uh, at TransferWise in New York. And I'd love to talk to you guys about the exciting opportunities there. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. So currently these are all of our panelists, but we will have another panelist joining us later after we break out into the breakout rooms. So I'm going to start with my second question now. And this question is going to be based on the things that have happened since COVID-19, was there anything that you guys or perhaps your company found to be previously impossible to be done virtually, but due to the pandemic has been able to be conducted virtually? And any of the panelists can just jump in and answer. Yeah, and I'll go ahead and start. For Bloomberg, it was really important that our engineers um, were able to do their jobs and adjust to working at home. Um, that meant providing each employee with a net $500 stipend to make sure they had um, any sort of like a chair if they wanted to buy one, if they wanted to buy another screen. That was really important to us. Another initiative was creating a, for a flexible working environment given we know that a lot of parents um, had kids who needed to needed attention and time during the day. Uh, so creating a sense of sort of either you start really early in the morning um, and you end at like one or two or three, or you start after 10 or 12 um, and work later in the day to accommodate for, you know, having to manage your kids at home or an elderly parent. And then really creating communication and community around supporting each other to make sure that we're all staying healthy and, and we're able to you know, fulfill our commitments to each other, but make sure our, our safety was first. Um, so that was a huge change for us and moving all of our recruiting online um, and changing our internship from in-person to an 11 week virtual internship that students do from home um, and not, being, not having to cut our internship because I know a lot of companies had to like shorten their internship to like five weeks, but we were really happy that we were able to keep our internship to 11 weeks. So super proud about that. Okay, thank you, Julio. Do we have another panelist who can speak on the things that have changed? Sure. Uh, it's kind of funny because the company I joined not that long before COVID started um, is was obsessed with travel. We have offices all over the world. The New York office is actually one of the smaller ones. 
And a big perk of working at the company was that I was going to get to travel all over the world. And that's completely stopped over the last six months. And I don't know about impossible, but the company is pretty surprised at how well we're all working together, despite not being able to meet in person. And uh, productivity hasn't gone down. People are getting comfortable at home. It's, it's kind of amazing that a company founded on the idea about traveling all over the world to keep in touch is still doing great without it. Yes, I, I think a lot of us are shocked by the idea that we've been able to do so much without physically seeing each other. Do we have another panelist that could answer the question? Yeah, I want to tag on to what Jonathan said. Um, the company that I work for is also, at least in my role, is based a lot on travel, uh, but not less so internal travel, more so external travel. Uh, most of our work is, is client facing. You know, we have to work directly with clients to implement our products. And what we found with COVID is that we really started to reevaluate what exactly needs to be done at the client site versus what we can do remotely, you know, with technology like Teams, Zoom, you know, video conferencing, things like that. So while we haven't been able to cut out travel completely because of, there just are still some things that need to be done on site, and we've definitely made a conscious effort to, you know, make sure that our people in traveling roles are you know, not on the road as much so that they don't potentially get exposed and, you know, their families or communities. Um, from an internal perspective, you know, a lot of our work has already been done remotely. We have a lot of, you know, um, our headquarters are based out of Kansas City, uh, but seeing that I'm working from New York, you know, we have a lot of people who are, who are already remote and it wasn't um, a huge shift in culture to have, you know, everyone go remote versus just a few people. Okay, thank you, Ryan. And is there another panelist that can speak on this? Uh, I'll go. Uh, so similar to Julio, uh, the internship program, we do have a 17-week apprenticeship program here at Co-op. So we are, um, you know, a classroom or a career development program. So we did have to go virtual, um, similar to a lot of the programs here in classes. Our classes were completely virtual, but something that was really exciting for our students is to see as um, a staff member who works in recruiting, but also the CR was that we do have talent matches where our employer partners uh, meet with students at the end of our 17 weeks, and they're able to still meet with them, um, interview for jobs, and also get career advice as well, too. So it's been really interesting how our team was able to take that from an in-person um, event and structure it out to a full week event where students are still able to share their projects, but also, um, you know, everyone's looking for jobs at the end of the day too. So it's nice that our, our employee partners stepped up and we were like, hey, we wanna do this with you as well too. So that's been something uh, really interesting on top of, you know, so the Julio was mentioning um, more, more cognizant of awareness of being for each other because 2020 has been a year. So we've also been doing town halls and our social workers have been also meeting with students in a virtual setting as well. Okay, thank you, Morel. And for Nicola and Zach, um, I know you guys are here to talk about the program. Has anything changed with the CUNY Tech program? Uh, so I actually started on the first day of lockdown and Zach started a couple weeks ago. So neither of us can speak to what it was like before. Uh, but what has been interesting certainly is seeing the population of students uh, dealing with the fact that everything is shifting to being uh, virtual, particularly because they're all going through the interview process, they're all uh, actively looking for internships and jobs out of the program. Um, and I think I, I've been surprised at how well we are still able to connect with our students and help them being virtual, partially because, uh, and something I'm sure Macaulay is very aware of, our students are from the 11 senior campuses, they were all commuting in to come to class in Midtown and doing everything virtually has really given them a lot of time back. Uh, and as a career coach, I think I get more engagement than I might have otherwise because students don't have to spend an hour and a half on a train to have a 15 minute meeting with me. We can just pop onto a call and that's been a really positive experience, I think. Zach, is there anything you wanna add to that? <laughs> Uh, not really. Yeah, I wish I could say more because I didn't start this job until uh, the lockdown was already in place. So I can't really comment on the change, but um, it, it is pretty interesting to be teaching completely remotely. So I don't really have any one on one time like with students like either before class or just in the middle of class just chatting about. And it's kind of interesting to see how that relationships are developing over Zoom 
And I think one thing that's really important is like turning on your camera screens. Like a lot of people, I think I feel like the students that get the most or I've, I'm able to develop the most relationship with are the kids that are, their cameras are on, they're talking during class and stuff like that, where some of them are kind of slipping through the cracks when they're just, it's, they're just not interacting as much. So that's just one of the things that I've seen change. Okay, thank you. And moving on to our next question, which is if each panelist can just tell us a little bit about your role and maybe the difference between what you're doing or what you were doing pre-pandemic versus post-pandemic. Well, I guess we're still in the pandemic. So pre-pandemic versus if you're still doing the same things now or if some things have changed or some things have been put on pause. I can go. Uh, so something that has definitely, well, in our role um, or my role as an associate director of recruiting is that we work with uh, CUNY campuses and senior campuses and two-year schools uh, to hold uh, workshops, but also uh, work with and recruit students who fit our uh, program demographic. And this for anyone awareness who's on uh, today's call, if you're first generation um, or identify as Black, Latinx, or Native, um, you're eligible uh, to be applied for our program um, as well. I'm sure that information is in the PDF somewhere. Um, but we have been doing a lot of traveling involved with our job. So similar to uh, what Nicola mentioned is that uh, we don't have to take an hour and a half commute. Um, I, I'm in Queens, so I don't have to go up to the Bronx every day to speak to Lehman College. I love Lehman College, but I don't have to get on the six train to get up there, you know, um, it's great with me. So that's been something that has changed a lot is that a lot of the engagements and workshops that we do at senior campuses um, have been completely virtual, along as, as well as the training that we do internally as well. Uh, we just don't meet in person. Okay, great. Anybody else? I would say one of the positives is that we can open our events up to more people. Um, we had an interview workshop and we typically host those in person and we usually have like 20 or 30 people. And in the session we had a few weeks ago, I think we had 145. Uh, so it definitely allows us to amplify our impact. Um, I think what we want to consider is trying to give people a comparable experience, even though they're sitting at home and aren't able to visit our offices, um, which, which is always an experience for folks when they visit for the first time. So I think the good thing is that you can sort of, to Nicole's point, um, you have more time because you're not commuting for 45 minutes or I'm not taking the train up to Lehman or to City College. So um, you do have that a bit more time to, to have Thank more you. program. You're welcome. I'm also a big Lehman fan because they're one of the schools that I am career coaching for. And yeah, I live in Jersey City. So going to see those students was like a once in a year opportunity. Uh, and we actually got quite lucky with, not lucky with the pandemic, but a silver lining is that we were able to hire Zach at all because he's in um, California. Uh, and when we were looking for candidates, we, the data science program is fairly new at CTP and we were really you know, focused on finding a great candidate. And the fact that we were able to interview someone from California who's obviously turned out to be the right fit for us uh, was a real silver lining there. I can jump into kind of you know, talk about my role and how maybe it sort of changed. Um, so I mean, obviously I don't, I don't work on the recruiting side, you know, more so on the technical and implementation side, but I would say that my role has, at this point, my career has um, three main, four main different parts to it. So my primary role is in the implementation side. So I work directly with the healthcare systems, mostly across the country and Canada, um, occasionally, you know, worldwide, if one of our um, global offices has any questions. So we work with them to design, build, implement, and support our medical device integration products. Um, and that usually has me working with kind of different um, levels of, you know, healthcare organizations, people, you know, down from nurses, um, patient care techs, all the way up to, you know, sometimes the CNIOs, CIOs, um, directors, so really depending on what, who we're working with. Um, aside from that, I also have gotten to be involved in the pre-sales process as well as the software and hardware development. So I work with um, our sales teams to make sure that their quotes are accurate, that they're um, accounting for any requirements that the clients might need. And we're also working with not only our internal software development team, but also hardware and software development and our partners to make sure that any products that we're selling together, since we do integrate with them, is working according to all of our standards. Um, and kind of 
um, a recent development, especially um, post pandemic with myself traveling a lot less has been a lot of focus on data analytics. Um, I think the healthcare tech industry is starting to realize that there is a lot of data out there and that there, it, it's not really being used to the fullest degree that it can be. So, you know, trying to find new applications for all the data that we have and also finding ways to gather it and use it effectively. Great, I'll go next. Uh, at, uh, right now I'm a full stack developer at TransferWise. We do international money transfers. So my job is focused around sending lots of money from the United States to other parts of the world. And um, a lot of, it's a, it's a new company. It looks really fancy when you're using the product, but underneath the banking system in the United States is very, very old. So it's really a patchwork system of making sure that the money gets to the place where it needs to go, sending a lot of files around, uh, kind of archaic compared to the rest of the world. So a lot of emergencies going on over there that we have to fix every day. Uh, my job has not really changed at all since COVID started. Uh, the, my team is the same. We work on the same product. One crazy thing is that our office has actually reopened. So we're allowed to go in a few days a week if we want to. And uh, that's been nice to get back to normal in some sense. That's great. Thank you. Okay. So for my next question, I wanted to ask Julio. So I noticed you have a pretty long list of experience, including working at Goldman Sachs and JP Morgan. And this was prior to you joining Bloomberg. So mm -hmm. I was wondering if you could explain if there's been any overlap between your roles at each of these companies. Yeah. So at GS, I was at uh, Goldman Sachs. I was at the learn. I was in, on the learning and development team with the focus on diversity and culture. Um, and at JP Morgan, I was a head of campus for sales trading and research for campus recruiting for North America. So, um, sort of coming into Bloomberg, where I'm working on diversity projects and initiatives, managing a lot of our partnerships with like SEO, MLT, Prep for Prep. Um, it's almost like a combination of both roles where I'm, I'm working on equity in the workplace and programs to help students um, be successful at our company. And I'm also um, working on our recruiting initiatives. So a big piece of that now is sourcing. So moving away from like having a huge event and then just having people apply to finding people on websites like Jumpstart, leveraging our partners, um, finding people on LinkedIn, having sort of an intake conversation, um, and then sort of coaching them through the process, um, which is a different model than I've had before. So it's also, it's familiar, but it's also very new. Um, and I've never covered tech before. So uh, learning a lot about um, software engineering at the same time. So it's, it's familiar, but new and exciting at the same time. That's wonderful. And moving on uh, for Brian. So I know that you're currently also a part-time student at Well Cornell Graduate School of Medical Sciences. So in addition to working full-time as an integrated technologies architect, um, you also part-time go to school. And so since COVID, have there been any new developments that have greatly affected both like the health and tech industry? So I would say not, not specifically um, since COVID, but it's, it's definitely something that's pretty recent. This is kind of going back to my last, uh, my last point, is that there is definitely a, um, a greater emphasis and greater focus on you, the use of data in healthcare and in the healthcare technology industry. So um, for those of you who might not be familiar, there are a lot of regulations governing the healthcare industry, and one of them is something called meaningful use. And meaningful use essentially says that um, it's a bench, essentially a set of regulations and sets different levels for how um, connected or how well a health system uses technology in their you know in their day to day activities. And you know one of the early pushes in the in the days of meaningful use was to get all healthcare systems on electronic healthcare records and off of paper charting. And you know nowadays pretty much every healthcare system is charting digitally. So the question for from a lot of clients has started to move from, you know, how do we connect our stuff to, okay, we've connected it, you know, show me my KPIs, show me my return on investment, you know, show me that what I spent my money on is worth it. And, you know, up until, you know, up until today for certain things, we've had to come back to our clients and say, well, we don't know. And that's not a, you know, that's not a good look for, for us. And that's not an answer we want to have for them. So 
um, there's definitely a lot more focus on data and it's also kind of what prompted me to pursue my my, uh, my master's in health informatics you know to figure out how exactly we can harness all of this and put it to good use that's wonderful that it's combining both health and the tech industry to hopefully help us out in these hard times. And moving on, uh, I wanted to ask Nicola, as a career coach, you generalize in guiding a lot of students in career planning and tactics behind getting a career, but are there certain knowledge or skills you believe are critical for career advancement or opportunity specifically within the tech industry? For sure, yeah. I think, so my, my uh, approach to tech before being a career coach at CTP is that I have a pretty extensive tech network, um, particularly my husband who was in publishing before and then did the um, Full Stack Academy boot camp and now works at Bloomberg. So seeing him, yes, shout out to Bloomberg. They, uh, you should see all his monitors. Bloomberg took care of uh, our home office situation very nicely. Um, definitely uh, the thing that I saw him go through and then also something that I work on with a lot of my students is the difference between the tech skills and like the computer science skills specifically taught at the university level are not always the same skills that a programmer is going to use day to day in their job. Uh, and so, you know, CTP, this is kind of why we exist is to help improve that skill set. But the students who we see being really successful, they're ones who have made a personal investment in their time to work on more of those technologies and tools that are going to be useful at that entry level um, position. Uh, and with that, learning how to craft a resume that really highlights that you have that skill set is particularly important in tech. Uh, it's a much more technical process when you're applying for jobs in that industry. And so learning how to optimize your resume for that audience, uh, particularly since a good portion of that audience is actually AI, uh, is a specific skill set for sure. Okay, thank you. And can I can I add a quick point yeah, about that? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I mean, at Bloomberg, we review every resume that's submitted to us. Um, literally, I spend about an hour each day during like this time frame reviewing resumes. So, the resume really is the should be like one of your main focal points because if the resume isn't strong, you could be the best coder, but if you don't have the right information on your resume, you're not going to move forward. Um, so I think that's, that's definitely where you should lean on um, your advisors, your professors, your teammates, and your classmates to, to make sure you have a really strong resume. Julio, how, how, how important do you think um, cover letters are? Yeah. We don't ask for a cover letter. <laughs> the, ongoing, uh, the ongoing struggle. Do I yeah. write a cover letter or not? Will they read it or please, will please they? Please don't. <laughs> This is good to know. I'll add Bloomberg to my to my blacklist for cover letters. I, I would say though, a cover letter is or like a application form might be a little much. But if you're personally reaching out to somebody with a resume, a, like a think of a cover letter as like an opening paragraph as well. Yes. So you don't want to be like, "Here's my resume," and it's going to be like, "Okay, uh, you know what will I do with this?" Uh, but if you have think of a cover letter as like opening paragraph, and use an opening paragraph if you're personally sending an email to a person you want to connect with or a potential recruiter. Um, yeah, definitely, definitely if you're reaching out to me on LinkedIn or if, you are re if you've hacked my email, definitely introduce yourself um, and give me some insight into why you're interested in Bloomberg, what makes Bloomberg a place you want to work. I want to say you've done some research. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Great, thank you. And speaking next to that would be for Morel, um, as a Coop alum and also a current employer, do you find yourself still implementing digital marketing strategies throughout your work and does it overlap with your current role? Um, yeah, I think something that um, is really interesting is that there's a lot of transferable skills um, between industries, uh, particularly um, I'll say the soft skills um, as well. But I think in marketing, you're, you're speaking to people and you're marketing a product. I think as an alumni of the program, um, I feel like I have a little more invested in the marketing because I did it and I can speak to it a little easier. Um, but I think it's just really just being a proud uh, person about, the, about what I'm talking about. I know what I'm talking about. Um, and it's kind of, you know, it from there. So it's a, it's a nice job to talk about something. It's like talking about um, the Kalyans every day. You know, if you like, if you like your classes, like professors, you know, it's pretty easy. Um, and if you, know, you take it from there. 
So if you, if you talk about your product, you're good. Thank you. And for Zach, your career trajectory follows an extensive data um, analytics path. So from your experience, how has data been collected in your previous and curtain roles? And what are the common data quality issues that you've encountered? Uh, that's a great question. So I think that there, uh, there's two main ways that data is collected. One is like through interactions on your website. So mostly I think those boil down to conversions. Like did someone do this or did they not do this? Um, that's like the main thing that people kind of look out for in your own personal database. And the other kind of type of data that's collected is that there's a whole ecosystem of data vendors. So people that sell data in rich data that you can then apply and use it on your own database. Um, the major quality issues is being able to merge your own quality database with data provided by a data vendor. So like if you only have an email as a primary key and that email address isn't in the data that you just purchased, it's hard to like kind of leverage that new data. Um, also, which is highly specific is just duplicate values in databases. I feel like that always used to catch me off guard. I'd always be dealing with somehow a hundred times this one action got inputted into the database and would completely throw everything off. So just always check for duplicate values. Great, thank you. And Jonathan, so in your bio, you mentioned that you had left a PhD program and utilized your Python knowledge to land an entry level position at a software company. So could you share with us the transition and what that was like, as well as going from a biology concentration into focusing on a software position and how much Python experience you had and how much that affected your job? Sure. Uh, yeah, I did science until it wasn't working anymore. Never be afraid to quit something if you're not enjoying it. And um, there's a broad overlap between technology and science these days. It's every lab needs someone who knows how to process data. And so I learned Python for that purpose and only that purpose. Uh, you would be amazed at how little Python I knew when I got my first job in tech. Uh, the, I can tell you the only coding I did during that interview was uh, to write the Fibonacci sequence, uh, an algorithm uh, method to print out a Fibonacci sequence. It wasn't even that well done, but I still got the job. Um, and yeah, I'm blinking on other parts of this question, but I guess my main point is uh, don't be afraid to apply for jobs that you think you might not be qualified for. If you impress in the interview, it can be a great stepping stone. Okay, thank you. And. With that being said, you know, overlapping with st uh, like STEM sciences and technology, where do you see the, well, this is for any panelist, but where do you see the tech industry heading within the next, let's say five years, or what are some major milestones or changes that you've observed just within the past five years or even within the past few months due to COVID? And again, anyone can jump in. I'll keep going real quick because okay. it's near and dear to my heart. Uh, COVID has shown that everything is software. I mean, we were locked in our houses for three months. The whole world is software. There's no limit to the number of software jobs that will be available over the next few years. And so uh, it's not peaking. It's, it's a great time to enter software. And any idea that you have is, is an opportunity for a job. I think a big change is the need to communicate. So I think, I think as you prepare for interviews, your ability to communicate is really key, given that we just can't sort of walk over to somebody. Um, being able to be succinct and efficient in your communication style is going to be really important. I know for us, communication is one of the pillars that we evaluate people on. And if you, it's, and if you can't Sort of communicate and collaborate. It's, it's going to be it's going to be a challenge for you. So really focus on being able to communicate well, collaborate, work in teams, reach out to people, ask questions, reach out to people to help if if they're new to your team, um, because it's definitely going to be it definitely takes some extra effort to connect and collaborate, given that we're working from home and we don't pass each other in the pantry or on our way to grab lunch. Um, you really have to make an effort to communicate and, and collaborate. 
Yeah, I just want to also add on to what um, Julio, and especially what Jonathan said. Um, you know, definitely there are, you know, like Jonathan said, everything runs on software nowadays. And I think, at least the key for me is, you know, I don't, I don't particularly work in software development, but I work with a lot of software engineers. Um, but for me, the important thing is not just finding um, software that you're passionate about, but also an industry that you care about, you know. If you care about the product that you're making as an engineer, right, you're going to you're going to put out a quality product and you're going to be happy with it. But, you know, if, if you're just in the job, you know, just because you want to work in software development, you're, you're going to burn out after a couple of years. So definitely find something that you're interested in. Um, you know, just like Jonathan said, you know, it's you don't necessarily need to have the technical skills to get the job. When I first got my job, I knew nothing about healthcare. I knew nothing about software. I couldn't tell you what the difference was. I couldn't tell you what, what oxygen saturation was. And I definitely could not talk to nurses. Um, but a lot of the things, you know, you can definitely learn on the job. So as well, as long as, you know, you're willing to put in the effort and you're showing on your resume that, yes, I am truly interested in this company and in this industry, then, you know, you'll find a way to succeed. Okay, do we have any other panelists that would like to speak on this? If not, I can move on to our next question. No? Okay. So before we move on to breakout rooms uh, soon, uh, I wanted to ask what is one or maybe a few pieces of advice that all of you would want students here today to walk away with or maybe certain uh, pieces of advice about like the certain programs that you recruit for? Um, I'll say the biggest thing that I think Brian Johnson and Julio all said in their last answer is don't be afraid to be yourself and explore what interests you now, like intentionally. Um, it's a lot when you have, you know, I, I think everyone has their own responsibilities in life, but I think that kind of exacerbates and gets heavier uh, once you graduate as well. So I think now's the opportunity to really explore um, what you like to do um, in your careers and don't be afraid to make some mistakes along the way too, because everyone uh, does career switches, everyone makes, you know, uh, life switches. So don't be afraid to trust, trust yourself and do what you want. But also think about it at the same time as well. Make sure you think about it. Oh, and then I guess I'll talk about co-op too. Um, so a lot of things that co-op does um, in the program is that a lot of the soft skills that uh, have made importance are brought up is that we do teach that here. Uh, we talk, uh, we teach the fundamentals in data analytics. So Tableau, SQL, Power BI, Salesforce, Google Analytics, we teach the fundamentals in those. And we also really emphasize the soft skills. So we work on your most intelligence, uh, I think effective communication, um, and also this understanding how to essentially network in different spaces you may enter during the program as well. And we also work on your interve interview um, prep resume, and we hold panels throughout uh, the seven, two weeks of the program involved to the industry. Um, that you may be taking the program in, which again is data analytics or digital marketing. I can go quickly. Uh, I think my general advice would be you don't have to wait for whatever you're working on to be perfect. Uh, and this specifically has to do for me when, uh, when I have students building out their resumes, they've started a project and they won't put it on their resume because it's not done. Uh, what I know of software engineering is that it's never done. Uh, there's always more to be changed, more to be fixed. So your, whatever it is you're working on doesn't have to be all the way exactly the way you want it for it to be able to show that you have the skills and the, um, the drive to do what you're interested in doing. Uh, how that sort of relates to CUNY Tech Prep, uh, our application process includes a tech challenge, a coding challenge. And we lose a lot of students who just don't finish. They, they get nervous or they don't really know what they're doing. A lot of them, it's the first time they've done a tech challenge uh, or any sort of coding challenge. And so they don't do it or they don't finish or even worse, they cheat. Um, you don't have to finish and you don't have to get it right to be accepted to CTP. But if you cheat, you will definitely not be accepted. So we wanna see your process. We wanna see how you think and how you work. Uh, more than whether or not you can at this point successfully complete whatever challenge we've put forward. So if you're applying, bear that in mind. Uh, one thing I'd also like to add is like a lot of technical jobs, it's like it's not what's on your resume, it's what you know. So don't be afraid to reach out and to apply to jobs that maybe are a bit, the requirements are a little bit outside of your reach. Because um, I know that 
the jobs that I've, I've applied for, they have been out of my reach, but because I'm able to go in there and just, you know, they, because it's a technical interview, so they'll technically interview and you'll, you'll be able to get it or not get it. And they'll usually base whether they're going to, they're going to hire you based on that more than what's on your, the credentials in your resume. So don't be afraid to kind of reach outside of your comfort zone or reach out, kind of stretch your, your goals or your resume, if you will, because uh, if you can do it in the interview, then you'll get hired. Yeah, I, I would say get involved in the career process as soon as possible. I know that's really hard given that, you know, we're working, you're either working part-time, full-time and going to school, but there is definitely a difference, as we mentioned earlier, between what you're learning in school and what you'll be doing in industry. And you really have to transition that before you start interviewing and you have to wrap your mind around that. And that's a product of exposure and the time you dedicate um, you know, start working on projects. It, if you don't have the luxury to have internships, put work on your projects as many as you can, put them on your resume thoughtfully um, and get exposure to these oppor to opportunities through these immersion programs, through mentorship, sponsorship, um, and really bang on the doors of, of people like Nicole well, who have all these resources. No one's going to do it for you, right? And you really have to put the time in yourself. Um, that could be just dedicating an hour a week to working on lead code or, or daily coding problem. Um, you really have to sort of dedicate yourself to, uh, to preparation and that will be the confidence you need to be successful. I'm gonna double down on that. You should really have a website in your resume, not a personal website, but something that you built not describing yourself, but there's, there's just so many opportunities to come up with any small idea that you have and build a website for it. It's so great for an interview, for the interviewer to have this link that they can click on. There's so many free hosting companies out there and you can talk about what you built, why you built it, what you care about, because interviewing is scary. Uh, everyone's nervous when they interview, but it's really important to get good at it. It's a skill. And so apply for a lot of internships, start with the ones that you care the least about so that you can practice during those interview steps and get better at it and get calmer when you're doing it. And I just want to talk about a weird meeting that I was in this week. Um, it was about how to remove bias from the interviews that we do within the company, because we realize that we ask a lot of weird questions and it might bias us in one way or another. And that's a classic part of tech interviews. So I think that hopefully the industry is moving in a direction where we're not biasing against age or gender or race or any factor and be more open-minded in terms of understanding that you're not, you can't only hire the person who talks the best in an interview. It's, it's not a great way to build a good company. And to, just to kind of add on to what everyone else has said, um, you know, once once you've gotten your foot in the door and, you know, in your internship in your company, I think it's also important to remember to continue to be your own biggest advocate, you know, as you as you work through your company and work up through your career. Um, there's a saying out there that people don't quit jobs, people quit managers. And, you know, I think it's important to remember that, you know, your your managers are or at least in my company and a lot of other companies out there, they're gonna be the ones who are fighting for you for promotions, for raises, for things like that. And you wanna definitely have, build a good relationship with them, right? You know, they're all people too. And if you can continue to communicate um, your goals, your desires, and make sure that, you know, you guys are all on the same page, you're definitely gonna have a good time when you, when you continue to grow in your company. I'll say one thing uh, to add on to what Brian said, work doesn't have to be hard everybody it doesn't have to be stressful i think if you are again like communicate well with your team and obviously work will get busy because it's work but it doesn't have to stress you out as well too so make sure you build those relationships with your team members even though it may seem hard you don't have to be best friends but you at least have to be able to work and understand each other okay great and we actually have a little bit more time before the breakout sessions so i know a lot of the panelists have spoken about their own experiences or maybe lack thereof before they got into their specific roles or career paths and i figured i would ask the panelists what are some hard or soft skills that you think students right now especially since 
their home during the pandemic and might have a little bit more time than they would have if they were commuting, let's say, that could help them stand out more in an interview or maybe a program or some kind of job in your respective fields? I think a big one that I would focus on is um, working on your presentation and also working on your written communication skills. Um, you know, I spend most of my time every day in meetings with clients, um, giving presentations, writing emails, and it really goes a long way when you're able to uh, communicate in a professional manner. Um, I think, you know, especially in, in my company, there's a lot of people who start fresh out of college and the people that we're working with have years and years of experience. And, you know, if you communicate in a professional way through your written and your spoken communication, you know, you tend to not get the, you know, you tend to not get people doubting you based on your experience or lack thereof. So, you know, any ways that you can find to work on your presentation skills, your email skills, um, or any other verbal communication skills, I think would be helpful. Yeah, I absolutely agree about written communication, something that I've seen. I've been in a couple industries since graduating from college uh, and fresh graduates come in and won't be able to write an email and they won't realize that they can't write an email because it's not something you learn how to do in college like specifically uh, but being really comfortable in writing and being really comfortable or as comfortable as you can be in expressing your own skill set your own background uh, and expressing whatever it is that you need from someone in a professional and sort of um, collaborative way can be a really strong skill set and it'll especially since we don't get to talk to our coworkers in person as much as we used to uh getting to know um you know getting comfortable with the people you work with uh writing has a lot to do with that uh, and when you're applying to a program like ctp for example yeah it's a tech-based program but we ask you to write a lot of little essays and we those answers are a big part of the application process so being able to express yourself uh, and take that part of the application seriously uh, is a real uh, an easy way to spend a little more time and really enhance your application. On the technical side, it was alluded to before, but a lot of the things you learn in school aren't the things you do day to day in a tech job. And I would say if you're sitting at home and you have a lot of time on your hands and you're building your website, uh, contributing to GitHub projects would be a great way to show off your skills. Uh, you don't have to add new functionality. That's a lot of the time when you're working, that's not what you're doing. If you refactored some code or cleaned it up or um, contributed to these projects in any way, uh, it would really go a long way in an interview to show your GitHub page with tons of contributions to projects that you use because that's what you're going to be doing on the job. I'll say um, maybe not specific to the, the textbook, but I would definitely say um, the initiative for you all to explore all these modules, free academies and whatever, you know, is offered out there. Now's the time to do it. Um, I think if it really shows that you're interested in the career by the time you graduate, it doesn't, I'll say, obviously, if you don't understand the material, you can just have a bunch of resume points. And when it comes to interview time, you need to be able to speak to them. Um, but if you show that like during this, um, two or three years of my school, I did the classes that were required in my major, but also these extra um, out of campus uh, curriculums, I think that will really put you um, ahead and really just put that cherry on top on, um, when you have the time or when it's time to graduate and apply for jobs. I think a soft skill that can help you just stand out in the interview process is just showing, showing general interest in the company. If you are going through like even a phone screen interview and you talk about like a new feature that they just launched or something that the company just did, it's going to make, it's going to make the person remember you a bit more being like, oh, they've actually looked into the company and like are reading up about it and show interest in it. That, that, that goes a long way because a lot of times people don't do that and they just kind of go in there blindly, not really caring about the company. So showing that you care a little bit about what you're investing into or what you're applying for goes a long way. Okay, great, thank you. And as a follow up to the advice, I was hoping if each panelist could share if there was a time in your career where you faced a significant challenge or maybe setback and what you learned from it or how you were able to handle the situation. I 
I, I have oh, I mean, I feel like I was, I lost my job twice. I think that would be a, a major setback that I said. The first one I'll be transparent was um, I was uh, let go uh, just because of performance uh, related issues. Um, but I think the next job I was, re I was um, let go, but it was due to layoffs um, as well. So the first, obviously we will make mistakes. I can own that now. The first job was like, damn, I tried really hard. Um, this wasn't the right fit and I was let go. So I was like, what can I do for myself, uh, for my network? Um, and also to self-improvement to get through that. And then um, I, I was able to um, leverage my connections that I had at work. I was able to get my new job um, where I worked as a social media brand specialist. And even that job, I was really just like, you know, I'm going to do this. I'm, I'm going to do everything I do right. I learned from my last one. And even to my best efforts, they just ended up not needing me in that role anymore um, as well, too. So I think having a positive mindset, um, being self-reflective on how you can improve in situations, but also just understand sometimes it's not the right timing for a particular role even if you put your best effort as well. Um, so even if you get knocked down, don't worry about picking yourself up, even if it takes a while um, to do so. I can piggyback on that. I've left a job once and lost a job, was laid off once, and not to be crass, but both of them ended up with my next job making more money. So you can take like a loss like that and turn it into a positive, look at it like an opportunity. Uh, it's pretty exciting to lose a job if your next job is going to be a better fit and going to pay you more and make you happier. Uh, this is a question that everyone listening should uh, bear in mind because it's a very common interview question. Um, I think a challenge that I faced that kind of led me into the career change that I made into career services, uh, I used to have a very corporate client management role and I didn't take care of myself essentially. I, I stayed in a job longer than I should have with a really demanding and not great for my mental health client um, and waited until I was like fully burnt out um, in a bad place to leave that job. Uh, and it's, you know, it's not easy to leave a job. I, I was fortunate that we were able to have me leave a job temporarily uh, without having something else lined up. But if I had been paying attention to my needs, you know, a year earlier, I could have left that job uh, at a time that was less stressful and taken a little more time to focus on finding a new role. Um, so just listen to yourself if you are, if work makes you cry, <laughs> to be fully transparent, uh, there might be something wrong with your job. And that's something you should, should take seriously and, and listen to your own needs. I think you, you should always, I was gonna say, you should always be in a place where you feel like the company aligns with your values. And I think your mental health is really important. I had a job where I told my boss, what if I want to start a family? How would I do that if I'm working 10 to 12 hours a day and on the weekends? And she says, I can't answer that for you. And I didn't think that was a good response. Um, so I had to leave that situation. And it's, and then someone mentioned earlier, it's okay to leave something you don't, you're not happy with. Um, you're not doing a service to yourself or to your company if you're not giving, if you're not able to give 100% and you don't feel supported. Um, and then you just have to be really honest with yourself and really brave. Yeah, and just, just to piggyback off of that, you know, that's, you know, um, that's, that's always some advice that my, my manager himself has given me, you know, you know, I, I've been lucky to have a good manager who's been looking out for me, but, you know, he's, he's, he's just told me, you know, if ever you don't feel like you're being valued here, you know, I'm not going to blame you for leaving. You know, we've had that conversation many times. Uh, but to go back to the question that was being asked, I think the most, one of the most challenging parts of my career was probably the first six months when I started at my company, because like I said before, I knew nothing about healthcare. I knew nothing about health tech. And I didn't feel like the training that we had received prepared me for my job. So, you know, I'd be sitting there, no idea what's going on, you know, flying out to my first client site four months after I started and by myself, never having rented a car before, only having had my license for like six months because, you know, you live in New York City, you don't need a car. Um, but I think one of the things that I slowly learned was that in college, you know, I had the mindset that 
you know, knowledge and things would be handed to me. You know, you go to class, professors give you knowledge. You don't necessarily need to take initiative to ask for things as long as you show up to class. But it doesn't always work like that when you're working, right? You know, if you don't take the initiative to learn for yourself, you know, not everyone, not everything's going to be handed to you. And once I realize that, oh, you know, all the stuff and information need is out there. I just need to ask. You know, most of the time people are more than willing to help you. You know, if you ask your manager, you ask your team, you know, they've all been in the same situation that you have. So they're more, more than likely to help you, more than happy to help you. So um, once I, you know, learned that and started asking questions, things definitely got a lot easier for me. Uh, one thing that I had to overcome is so my job ended with the presidential campaign like the week COVID hit and I wasn't really able to go out and do my normal networking thing in terms of like because I was still very new and very discombobulated. So one thing I had to do is I sent out 61 different resumes for my next job. And that's just like even with a Google, even with Google on your resume like it doesn't like you just it's a numbers game. So don't be so you have to be persistent and keep on working at it and send out a lot of resumes because it's a numbers game. So I just want to stress that to everybody that, yeah, you got to just grind it out, if you will. Okay, perfect. Thank you. So this is actually going to be our last general question. And so we're going to go ahead and move into our breakout rooms. And as a reminder, Gia is going to be the one who moves everyone around and so she's going to take care of that. No one has to move or do anything else. But um, due to the way Zoom is working, Gia will be rearranging the panelists after you're moved into breakout rooms. So we ask that everyone is just patient with us as we get everything in order. And there are going to be multiple students in the breakout rooms. We have a total of six breakout rooms and it's going to be 10 minutes each. So this is a good time to ask any specific questions you may have written down. And we can also speak with the panelists about connecting with them afterwards or even your peers on LinkedIn. So I'll hand the mic over to Gia as she moves us into breakout rooms. <laughs> 